really feel like there's a big difference in politics with women because a lot of what you hear on the news and on TV is based on what they choose to wear. You don't hear that about men politicians. Yeah, it's always about you know uh, Michelle Obama's wardrobe, right? <laughs> <laughs> Endlessly, and but you don't hear about like the suit that you know that Barack's wearing. Yeah, so. And this, you know, I guess that has to do with this fashion consciousness or something like that. And, and the interesting thing is that, you know, wh who is this aimed at mostly? It's mostly aimed at women. It's like, you know, women want to wear about what, wear, read about what Michelle Obama's wearing. You don't see a bunch of men paying much attention to that. So it's kind of interesting, interesting dynamic. Particularly when you're dealing with all these sort of issues of social justice and, you know, the first lady wearing her $700 French sneakers to yeah. go, you know. <laughs> Talk of to, to to go to a soup kitchen. <laughs> so um, the other thing is is that the fem the feminist movement tends to to try to argue in the following way: there are no differences between men and women, therefore men and women should be treated exactly the same. And you you don't have to to believe this first thing to believe the second thing. In other words. The argument is there are no innate differences between men and women. It's all gender is socially constructed, and that it, it you know patriarchy is a creation of culture. That there are no there's no basis in biology for treating men and women differently, um, and so because of that, therefore they should be treated equally. And you can see this has some degree of plausibility. Like you might say the same thing about racial differences, right? So. Uh, there's no real difference between people with dark skin and people with lighter skin, uh, or you know, darker, or lighter skin, or in between. So therefore, we should all be treated alike. And it makes a little bit of sense, but it doesn't. Just because we should all be treated equally doesn't really mean there aren't any differences. So I mean, it's a way to try to make the political case by I think papering over the real differences in in uh, in, in the sexes, um, and so that. And the feminist movement has political reasons for trying to minimize those when they're really substantial. And you can see those, anybody who's had kids, even from the time the kids are, you know, really small, um, you get the, the uh, boys and girls, you know, play very differently. And, you know, culture can have something to do with that. So it's always a nature-nurture thing. But there still is this biological basis that, that um, you know, is, is going to make a difference. Um, oh, it's uh, any other any other before we get to this wage gap thing. Any um, anything else on uh, gender differences or on the feminist movement? Uh, anybody have a, a anybody take one of those? They have all these classes here, um, women's studies classes. Um, sociology usually does a lot in race, class, and gender. I tried to take one, and it was all girls, uh -huh. and then the lady wouldn't let me in. Really? Yeah. Now, were you were, were you like on a wait list or something? Or? Yeah. Okay. But I, if I, I figured if I was like a feminist study teacher, I would want like 13 of the guys with like 25 huh. year olds in the back. But do you think it was because they didn't want the, the, the guy there? I don't or know, do you I think it was just that it was full and they didn't want to add another student? I don't know. I don't know. It probably was a rough, rough class. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like it is the sort of this dual track argument. One is that there ought to be equality, but the other one is um, because we don't have equality now, we have all these special special dispensations for women. So, is there a men's center? No. Is there a men in transition? No. no. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. So there's special scholarships for men in nursing that aren't available to women. But also they want men in nursing because men can do a lot more heavy lifting than women. So they're like, yeah. So it's really huh. helpful to have a man, a male nurse. They're considered a 
Interesting. <laughs> the only place I can think of where, where male nurses are common actually is, and this makes sense, on the psych ward where you have you know, unruly patients that need to be wrestled down and given their injection or whatever. And also for like uh, older women, they love seeing a man. Like, oh, right. Yeah, they want the help from the man over a woman anytime. Huh, interesting. Yeah. So as you think about like the, the the way things have gone, so you have um, you know like sexual harassment laws which protect women in the workplace. You have all this sort of women transitions program. You have um, uh, a women women's studies programs and women's centers. I remember when I was in graduate school, they took this whole wing of the the library, which um, used to be it used to be like philosophy, and they took it. And they made it into like this women's uh, women's group, and they like walled it off, and so and it said like women and gender studies or something like that, and so, um, and I think it has a bunch of signs, <laughs> up there, signs up there that said safe space or something, and so and basically it was like a, this area that's just for just for women. I know sometimes gyms will have you know women only groups. So if we want to be all you know equal and the same, you know it seems like. We'd have unisex bathrooms. We'd have there would be no like segregated times or or areas in the gym. We wouldn't have special women's studies programs. It seems like if that's the way you know the the women want it, that's what we should do. Or you know we we should admit that there's inequality and we're going to sort of try to address it in different ways. Um, and you know selective service is another example. Women can't be drafted currently, and so so women get all these breaks. And then the other thing is um, um, family courts tend to favor uh, women over men for awarding custody of children is another one. Um, and a man has no say over whether uh, his girlfriend has an abortion or his wife, um, but he's responsible for child care until that child turns 18 and has to pay child support. So, another, I mean, so th there are these inequalities, but it seems like a lot of them sort of go in favor of, of, uh, of women. Um, other thoughts on that? Disputations? Are there cases where men sort of still seem to be top dog as far as the legal system or our society? Are you going into affirmative action there? Is that what you're saying? Oh, I, su I suppose, yeah. I mean, maybe we should wait for that. The, you know, the, the main beneficiaries of affirmative action are white women. Yeah. Um, but let's, let me save that until, until uh, yeah. save, that, save that until. Um, uh, Thursday. Well, I think of other cases where, like, are there cases still used in the corporate world? I mean, even there, you get there's the old boys network for like the the upper management positions, but even like the lower management, it's like they're bending over backwards to hire women because. I'm talking about like the up there. Well, like the the big yeah, management. Yeah, not like, like local management. You know, right. Positions are pretty similar to the ivory. I'm talking top dog. Yeah. And the question, why, why is that? And actually, that's a good segue to here. So you, you've probably heard these studies, and the, the numbers vary. They'll, sometimes I see them as low as 65 cents. Sometimes it's 80 cents. But this idea that women make 70 cents on the dollar compared to men. And it, you know, if you look at those studies, and this is one of the readings that I had about this. If you look at those studies, and you look at identical income, identical experience in the same field, uh, the, the numbers are nowhere near that. You end up with the... Uh, uh, you know, parity, or you end up with uh, a few cents difference. When you um, when you look at single women, uh, the single women actually come on top. They do better than the men do. So so the so the question is why is there this uh, why is there this disparity? So now do you still have overt discrimination? Well, I would I would say uh, you know obviously yes and. Um, you get particularly you have older, older CEOs, older managers, you know, who are making these big decisions. They're still from a, a more sexist age, and they're probably going to favor men. Um, but you know, on the other hand, there's pressure. There's affirmative action pressures, and even though there may not be any legal necessity, there's a whole PR thing, right? Um, it's bad PR to not have women working at your place, and. Um, 
And, and in academia, it's particularly, you have a sort of enculturated uh, idea that, that you need to sort of bend over backwards to hire as many women as you, as you can. And I remember um, uh, at one institution I was at, <laughs> was told to remain nameless, uh, um, they hired a, a black female professor. And uh, the reason um, that I had on very good authority was to quote unquote, kill two birds with one stone. So they, um, they, you know, they had uh, um, largely Caucasian faculty. I think I might have one guy who was Hispanic or something. And, and so, uh, so the idea is that you hire uh, a black and a woman and that would kill two affirmative action categories get the uh, EEOC off your back or you know, make sure you, you uh, uh, make some step towards uh, having a diverse looking faculty. Another place, um, I had a friend who went for a job and, and didn't get it afterwards, was having a frank discussion with a, a manager and asking why they hired this woman uh, instead of him in, in that he um, had been there for a while, he had great teaching evaluations and was a great candidate. She was coming from the outside and. Um, end up like getting pregnant <laughs> and uh, and leaving and having a kid, <laughs> so interest, interesting ironic outcome. And uh, he said, "Well, you know, the, you know, to be frank, the real reason is because she had these." <laughs> so it wasn't like she was like really well endowed or anything. It was just because she was a woman, and because they need to hire a woman. And again, sometimes you have overt affirmative action. You have quotas, your targets you're, supposed, you're aiming at. But sometimes it's just like there's pressure, institutional pressure, to hire more women, to hire more minor minorities, to serve the cause of social justice, to be fair and inclusive, to celebrate diversity and all those things. And the pressure, and it's not like necessarily the pressure is coming from outside. The pressure is coming from the inside of each of these faculty members it's that, that they're told the most important thing is to have a diverse faculty. So when you're in the higher, and you see two people, and, and one's a white male, and the other one's a, a woman of color, um, the white male's got to really stand out in order to get that job. Whereas before, it used to be the other way around, where you'd have um, a woman candidate, and it'd be really tough for her to compete. Now it's an advantage. So if you're a woman of color, uh, the, and you're not getting a job in the Deep South, uh, the world is your oyster, you know, apart from maybe the Deep South. <laughs> um, but if you're, if you're in the Northeast, or or even the Midwest, uh, your, your chances of getting a job are actually, uh, actually a little better. And um, so, so, but I mean, there is overt discrimination. So I want to, I'm not going to tell you there's no discrimination uh, against women in the workplace. Particularly certain jobs, um, blue collar jobs, jobs which require, um, you know, engineering, construction is still a place where women are discriminated against a great deal. Um, I mean, can you think of any other jobs where women face discrimination? Firemen. The police actually, it, for, for getting like beat cop jobs, I think the, the um, it's tougher for women. But, but there's all sorts, all sorts of uh, pressure to hire women in policing too, to promote them. Um, so, so, so uh, overt discrimination might might explain some some disparity between <coughs> men and women, but also years taken off for childbearing and rearing. So, um, because women are the ones that get pregnant, women are the ones that that nurse children. I suppose now you can feed the kid with a bottle, but there's uh, nursing a child is better. Women are have evolved to be the nurturers of children, and so they typically when they choose to have children, they want to be there with their kid for those first formative years of life. And the man is that the, typically doesn't have an interest in being the sole child care giver and giving up his career in, in taking that role on. Although sometimes, you know, some men do it, but it, it's pretty rare. Um, also, you have, you have, you look at just women's choices for what kinds of careers they pick. And women tend to go into fields that don't pay as much as men. And they're looking at things like quality of life, where men are just looking at the dollar signs. And they're also looking at things like prestige, more than women are. And so men will go into, say, a sales job, where the only limit on your income is how much you can sell. And it requires a lot of traveling, being away from home. And you know, men will gravitate towards those jobs. Women will think, 
well, I've got these kids in school. I want to like pick them up and take them to their dance lesson and soccer practice. And I don't want to be away from my family for that long. And by the way, do you have flex time? Because I like to, you know, I like to take off a little early if the they're they're doing like a teachers meeting at my kid's school. Um, and so women are much more reluctant to take jobs with long hours, which require or which require a lot of travel away from home. And those tend to be the jobs which which uh, pay more. Also dangerous jobs, you know, working on an oil rig. Um, th there are a lot of, there are a lot of jo jobs which require risk, jobs which aren't that stable. Yeah. Uh, in my profession, with a lot of my firefighters, my summer jobs, there's probably probably somewhere between fifty to one hundred to one ratio of men to women. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it's to those, and then you think of these brain differences. So men tend to be more left brain, more mathematically inclined. Women tend to be more verbal. And so where do you see a lot of women? Uh, well, actually, you're getting more and more women at take, getting law degrees, and those are that's a pretty high paying profession. Um, but then you look at degrees like engineering, aerospace, and these sort of technical fields. They also pay really well, and economics, which is highly mathematical. So the the top paying degrees are like engineering, economics, um, uh, tech, technology related jobs, and those are, are male dominated. And uh, you know, some of it has to do with uh, innate uh, aptitudes in, in uh, men and women. Um, where women, women still gravitate towards these healthy professions, nursing, teaching, and so on. Um, Again, going back to our hunter-gatherer society, men tend to identify with their careers. And you know, this isn't an excuse for wife beating, but what happens, why, why do men beat their wives? Typically, they lose their job, they feel really, really depressed because they are their job, and because they feel that their value as a man is in earning money to support their family. They get really depressed, they can't find a job, they start drinking, they get, they build up all this stress, and then it, you know it, it gets released in a socially unacceptable way in uh, violence against their family. Um, very few women uh, engage in spousal and, and child abuse in a violent sort of way, and the reason for that is that again, uh, um, even if a woman loses her job, she's still got her family, and that can be a primary identification for her, where. Uh, she doesn't feel like she's less of a woman because she's not, she's not uh, um, employed, or, or that she's lost like that one particular job. And also, again, you know, um, why is a man erupting in violence? Well, because he's got all that testosterone churning through his system. Um, not again. This is an ex explanation. It's not. It's not an excuse. There's a here's a funny little anecdote. So there was this um, guy in Sweden, and he was uh, this big burly guy, and he uh, was beating his wife. So his wife got this bright idea, and she took her birth control pills and was like dropping them in his morning coffee. And over time, the beating stopped, and he became like, he sort of hang, hang around the house. He started to spend more time with the kids, and everything was going great until the, the, the hair in his chest started to fall out. And his uh, voice started to crack, and then you re uh, then the jig was up, and she the, this actually came out in court that it turned out that that the estrogen was actually having an effect on his uh, aggression, but you know went a little too far. So, <laughs> so other thoughts on on men and women on uh, uh, equality under the law. Sandra Fluck uh, case. You want to weigh in on that? So Sandra Fluck, um, she testified before Congress, and she was saying that Georgetown Law School, a uh, a Catholic institution, uh, should have to um, cover birth control on her insurance, even though they're a Catholic university and birth control is against the Catholic religion. 
even though many Catholics ignore it. So is that, is that really a feminist issue or a women's issue, or is that more like a sort of liberal conservative issue? But I think it shows sort of like seeing that as like the, the, uh, the Democrats right now are sort of running this war on women campaign. My view is because the economy is crappy and they need something. So, so they're going, the GOP is against birth control, and they want to restrict women's access to birth control. When really they're just saying, hey, if you're a private law school, you're offering insurance to your students. They know what the score is when they come there. Then you're a Catholic institution. Uh, they ought to be able to decide whether they're going to cover it or not. It's a matter of individual conscience or religious liberty or something. Um, but it's sort of painted in terms of this idea that GOP's war on women and that they want the, the GOP is against women's rights. In this particular case, it seems like it's the question, it's more of the question about whether the government gets to decide what's covered on your insurance policy or whether the person who's paying for the policy gets to decide what's covered. Um, and that's where I, yeah, go ahead. I think it's a matter of personal choice. If you know what the standards are for that college before you attend it, you're making a conscious decision, which you just talked about beforehand. It's a matter of personal choice and conservatism versus as we have the pregnancy issue. Mm -hmm. I don't think the college would be paying for a perspective either. Right, yep. And I think um, she actually went there. She's a part of some group. I think she, Part of the reason she went there, first of all, it's a prestigious law school, and she didn't. She said, "Look, I didn't want to go to a second-tier law school." The other thing was, I think she wanted to sort of be an activist and change it. She was part of some activist group on campus that wanted to sort of force the equality. And she would say, "You know, it's part of uh, healthcare, and women have the special healthcare need that we men don't have. So therefore, it ought to be covered in the, the interests of equality." Would, would be her argument. Um, but you know, the Catholic Church is a sexist institution. <laughs> In case she hadn't noticed, I don't know if she'd she'd noticed that. But you know, the, uh, has there ever been a woman pope? Are there cardinal popes? Uh, are there any? Can you become a priest if you're a woman? No, no, and no. <laughs> so it's a uh, um, yeah. So the Catholic Church is a patriarchal institution. So I don't know why you'd expect a, a quality there. And then you, you get to this question. I guess it again comes to this question about. To what extent should um, should the government place mandate on private institutions to into how they conduct their business? And I suppose this will come up when we talk about affirmative action next time. You know, if you're a private institution, should you should you be required not to discriminate, or should you even be required to have special programs to that uh, benefit uh, certain targeted minority groups in the interest of of creating a, a more fair and just society? So that'll be our topic next time. And uh, I think we're going to go out uncharacteristically early. Uh, so, uh, so I'm not cut off in mid-sentence. <laughs> so see you guys on uh, Thursday Affirmative Action. What if you're, if you're in fear of your...